It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast. So we have uh, two that have now made it to the Final Four. One, anything but a surprise, as UConn continues its uh, overpowering ways. And, and today, uh, in stunning fashion, a game that was 23 up, uh, amazingly, amazingly became as one-sided as any NCAA tournament game you will ever see. And for them to put together a 30-zip run against a team of the caliber of Illinois shows you that this team that, I, I, you know, a lot of people picked. Uh, I've told you for months now that I thought that they were uh, ahead above everybody else. Um, I'm hoping, I'm very glad Alabama's there. Alabama will be a huge underdog and, and decided, and uh, I don't give Alabama very much chance at all, although I'm happy they're there. I picked them to get to the Final Four. I picked UConn to win it all. I picked Alabama to make the Final Four. I can't get Houston there because, you know, they lost last night, uh, and I picked Purdue. I'm hoping that this ends with a Purdue-UConn game because that's the only thing left for, for UConn, that you could maybe create a scenario where the player of the year, the big man, can overpower his contemporary on UConn and you know have such a performance that he would lead his team to a win against this overpowering UConn team. That would be a great story. Uh, Purdue still has work to do. They'll have a favorable crowd tomorrow as they take on Tennessee. It will not be in any game by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, And then Duke and NC State in the other game. But UConn today, and UConn didn't shoot the ball well. Uh, If they had scored well, who knows what the score would have been. They shut down Shannon, who had been averaging 31 points in these playoff games. Um... He wound up with eight points. They couldn't make a shot. And I don't want to be negative towards Illinois, which had a great year. but And their coach is a very talented coach, and he's got a a great background. But I could not disagree more with his strategy to attack Klingon all day uh, and to relentlessly continue to attack him when it never, ever, ever, and underline ever worked. They couldn't get a basket attacking him. They rushed their outside shots, and what they did was go scoreless for a long, long period of time. And as he said before the game, if you go scoreless against them, if you have a drought, it's over. And it was over as they put forth one of the amazing stretches in NCAA tournament history. I was at a game many years ago when I was working for CBS. And it's a game I I never will forget. Georgetown was playing Kentucky, and Georgetown would go on to win the championship with Ewing. Uh, This was Ewing's junior year in Seattle. They played Kentucky in the semifinal game, a much-anticipated game. Houston was winning its way to the final, where it would be Ewing against Olajuwon in the final. Georgetown was a superior uh, defensive team, pressure defense, Ewing at the back end, Gene Smith, one of the great defensive guards in history, and they held Kentucky scoreless for 13 and a half minutes of relentless defense, which was one of the amazing things I had ever seen in an NCAA tournament game. I was courtside for that game. Joe B. Hall was so frustrated he turned and the Kentucky coach and threw his program in the stands during this stretch. It was so overpowering. That is what we saw from UConn today, a stretch that will be talked about forever. And when you realize that they have led every one of their NCAA wins by 30 points this year, every opponent at some point in the game, they have a 30-point lead on them. That is so far past overpowering. Even the, forget the UConn teams. 
of Calhoun. Forget the uh, Georgetown teams. Forget any team you want to talk about. You would have to go back to the UCLA teams, and the UCLA teams were never that dominant like this. This level of dominance has been unbelievable this year, the way this team has played. And now they have not won their way into the Final Four. They have stormed their way into the Final Four. Alabama got off to a terrible start, couldn't make a shot. Their shot maker, they have multiple shot makers, but their big shot maker, Sears, had a nightmare in the first half. He could not make a shot, and you knew that if he didn't get hot in the second half, that Alabama would go home. Uh, They weren't going to get a game um, out of Nelson. He was in foul trouble like they did in the win over Carolina. That game will be remembered for a long time. They needed Sears to come up big, and he came up enormous in the second half, putting on a three-point display. Alabama, Clemson had shut down everybody they'd played from three, and they'd gotten big leads in games. They got a big lead in this game. They got a 13-point lead in the first half, and Alabama looked like they were in big trouble. But Alabama stayed with it, finally started connecting. Sears got red hot in the second half. Alabama made 16 threes. They got a wonderful performance from Stevenson, who put up 19 points. They got a great performance from Pringle, who had 16 and 11, getting inside and getting offensive rebound after offensive rebound. Alabama had 14 offensive rebounds in this game and really made uh, Clemson pay. Clemson shot just 50% on the foul line. Uh, 30% from three. And although they made shots down the stretch of the game, and there were a lot of shots made, just like the Carolina game where shot after shot was being made, shot after shot was being made in this game in the second half. I mean, it really was. Alabama was making them. They scored 104 points in the second half. Clemson made a bunch of shots, got a bunch of inside three-point plays. Alabama made shot after shot after shot after shot from three. 16 threes in an NCAA tournament game is a tremendous amount. In a, conf- in a regional final, it's an epic number of threes. 16 made threes. That's 48 points from three. They wound up with 89 points in the game. A low-scoring game became a high-scoring game, and they won at 89-82 to be- go to the uh, final four for the first time ever. Yes, they will get to enjoy it. Yes, they will meet mighty Yukon, but right now they don't care about that. That's a worry they will have next Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Uh, but right now they just will celebrate, you know, finally getting to a final four and Yukon versus Alabama is half of the final four Sunday games, Tennessee and Purdue. One versus two. Edie has done everything he's supposed to do. He has gotten really wonderful support from his supporting cast in this tournament. They've played very well, and they dismantled Gonzaga. They have a big edge in the crowd. Purdue's a three-and-a-half-point favorite, and no more because Tennessee is a legitimately tough, rugged, deep, talented team. I could see a close game. I think it'll be a close game. I think Purdue will wind up winning it by five or six points at the end. Edie will be the difference. The crowd will be the difference. And Purdue will get to a Final Four where they will await the winner of Duke and NC State. NC State has had an incredible run. Two weeks ago, their coach was probably getting fired. They won the ACC. They had to run the table to get into the NCAA tournament and win the ACC. They did. They have put forth win after win, some of them pretty, some of them not pretty. They stunned Marquette with a very good performance. They've gotten out in front in these games. They've made shots in these games. They've done a lot of interesting things in these games. They've gotten a lot of good performances in these games. Duke 
got a huge break. Okay? It's the way it goes. Guys get hurt. Would Houston have won if they're All-America? And we're talking first-team All-America. Player of the year caliber player gets hurt and can't come back in the game. Houston's up six when he leaves. They wind up losing by three. Samson said today, it wasn't a fair fight when I lost my player. Okay, that's fine. Even Duke admitted that. But there's nothing that can be done about it. Duke still showed resiliency. Last year, Duke was embarrassed because Tennessee ran them off the court. out physical them. Duke wanted no part of it. They wanted no part of the game. Tennessee beat them up. And Duke really went home with the tail between their legs. When they saw uh, James Madison and heard the tough talk, they responded with a brilliant performance. When they got out and they got off to a terrible start against Houston, they responded. They responded with toughness. They responded with grit. They bring that to the table. And I'm going to tell you something else. I don't want to take anything at all away from NC State. But I have watched teams get open threes on countless occasions against NC State, and they just haven't dropped. Sometimes that happens. Some days that doesn't happen. And when that doesn't happen, you go home. Duke is a, you're probably surprised that Duke's a seven and a half point favorite in this game. I think it's realistic. They played well against Marquette and Marquette missed a million wide open shots. Marquette missed a million foul shots. Remember, Oakland had a possession in regulation to shoot NC State out of the tournament and didn't get a shot off. They ran a terrible play. But they were within that. They were within seconds of maybe knocking them out of the tournament. That's where the tournament goes. We know that. But what I'm trying to say diplomatically is I think NC State's been a little lucky. Sometimes in this tournament, threes don't fall. And when they don't fall, they go halfway in, they come out. They go around the rim, they come out. And they don't fall. And we see those games where they just don't fall. And those teams go home. They keep shooting the threes, and they say, wow, we just couldn't make a three. In, in the game of college basketball, a lot of these threes are open looks that just don't go down. And then sometimes they do, like Alabama in the second half. In the first half, Alabama's threes didn't go down. In the second half, they went down time and time and time again, and Alabama's going to the Final Four. My point, I think Duke has too much firepower for NC State. I think they win. And if you're interested in the point spread, I think Duke probably covers late. I would take the two favorites. I like the two favorites today. I like the two favorites tomorrow. If you're talking about point spreads. I think the Purdue-Tennessee game will be close. I just think late, a couple of foul shots. Tennessee misses, throws up a couple of bricks, and Duke, Purdue wins by four or six. I think that game will be close. I think if Duke plays its game tomorrow and the shots fall at a reasonable level, I think they get their revenge. Plus, I think the worst thing that could have happened for NC State is beating Duke in a big spot. Duke is not going to be surprised by some 11 seed here. This is a team from their league that just beat them. This is a team down the block. This is a very big game. Of course, for NC State, they're playing Duke. 
down there, NC State has very little status compared to Duke and Carolina. And this is Duke. And they have awakened. They were gritty against James Madison. They were gritty against Houston. Would they have beaten Houston? I don't know if they would have. I, I would think they probably wouldn't have. I would have think they would have lost a close game. But they, it didn't happen. I mean, Shea couldn't play. It happens. I think when the smoke clears, UConn and Alabama are joined by Purdue and Duke. I really, I don't want a UConn-Duke final. I don't want it. I know it sounds good on paper. It's exciting for the TV. It's exciting for the ratings. I don't think it would be a good game. And I'd like a little drama. I'd like to have to see if somebody, listen, all along, I've told you since I started talking about college basketball, since I talked about UConn at Christmas time, talked about him during the NCAA tournament, talked about him all the time, talked about him after seeing him on February 1st against St. John's at the Garden Live. I saw them three times this season live. I kept telling you, they are a head above everybody else. They are an incredible team. It's going to take an incredible player and circumstance to beat them. The only possibility of that is Purdue with Edie having a game where he fouls Kling in and out and dominates the game from there in and makes UConn work. That's the scenario. That's what I said from the start of this tournament when I picked you come to win it all. I picked Purdue, I picked Houston, and I picked Alabama. And I picked Alabama by a process elimination. I told you that. I didn't love them, but I didn't love anybody in that bracket. I didn't love, I, hate, I didn't like Arizona at all. I didn't like Carolina. So I picked Alabama. I didn't think Michigan State matched up against Carolina. Otherwise, I would have probably picked Michigan State with Izzo, but I didn't like the Carolina game. And frankly, I didn't know if. I didn't know if Alabama was going to get past Alabama, uh, get past Carolina, and they did. Just barely, but they did. They they are not getting past. I don't care if they they're going to have to make thirty threes to to beat UConn. But they've already. You see, Alabama's already had its great year. Duke, with a win tomorrow, will have had its great year. Purdue, less so because of Edie and his presence. But the Purdue to the Final Four will mean a lot. The only one that has no satisfaction by getting to the Final Four is you-know-who. They didn't come here to go to the Final Four. They didn't come here to play Monday night. They came here to dominate. But I said when the bracket came out I would love to see big man on big man on Monday night and I'm still hopeful that we can get that Tennessee's dangerous they're dangerous they can win tomorrow I don't think NC State will win tomorrow I do think Tennessee can win tomorrow I'd be surprised if NC State wins. I know everyone's on the NC State bandwagon. I am not. And I'm not knocking them in any way, but I'm just saying I don't think that this is a good scenario against Duke with them just having beaten Duke. Duke knows them very well. It's not like they're going to get surprised by a team in their own league, a team they see all the time. Right? They're not your typical 11 seed. That's some Cinderella. Now, 11 seeds they get to the Final Four often are, you know, LSU got there once as an 11 seed. A lot of times they come from big conferences. Villanova got to the Final Four and won it all as an eight. They, they came from a big conference. They just didn't have a great year. 
Same thing with NC State. They got in the back door, but they, you know. And they are being compared to the Valvano team. But I think it's very different. That was magic, and I was there, and a lot had to go right. A lot. Houston had to do a lot of things wrong to lose that game. Quickly, just for a minute. So, you can, Alabama, congratulations. The line is going to be astronomical. I want to see how high they make it. You know, the last two games they have backed down the lines thinking both teams, San Diego State and Illinois, would play better. And they both got blown out. Now, let's see what they make the line against Alabama because – you know, you kind of covers every game. And then Duke and Purdue, and I hope, I hope Purdue gets there. I really do, because I think they set up for a great Monday night if they do. Yankees come from behind today again. Cabrera hits another home. He's off to a fair start. Soto hits a, a big home run. Volpe hits a home run. They get good relief pitching. They now have beaten the Astros three straight times. So for Yankee fans who were trying all winter to get that awful taste of last year's debacle out of their uh, minds and hearts and mouths, this has been very pleasurable. Three straight wins against Houston. Houston's done... You know, Yankees did a lot of things sloppy tonight, too, behind Stroman. A lot of errors. But they came back, long ball. Cabrera's, you know, a lot of times last year he was dreadful. He is off to a fast start. Soto, hey, Soto's a man on a mission. Let's be honest. He's going to have a big year. Stays healthy, he's going to have a big year. Volpe looks very good. Let's see how much he's improved in terms of patience at the plate, stuff like that. Pitch selection is the big key for him. Cut down on the strikeouts a little bit and pitch selection. Make contact, pitch selection. You know, he's going to hit some home runs. You know, he's going to steal some bases. So they're off to a big start, 3-0. and This was a tough opening week. Four in Houston, three in Arizona before they came home. And they've already opened it up 3-0. and So they are playing with house money in the biggest way tomorrow night. As for the Mets, Severino didn't have it. He wound up striking out six. He lasted five innings, but he gave up nine hits. Got hit pretty hard. Milwaukee makes contact. They got some good players. Mets handled the whole thing terribly with Hoskins. Um... They got some home runs today, so they made it close. You know, they they got the pinch hit home run by, by Beatty. They got the uh, uh, home run by Alvarez. They got the home run late by Alonzo. So they got three home runs. They lose at 7-6. They're 0-2. They need a win. The Mets and their manager will be pressing very, very, very quickly. If they, you know, you go you go into the baseball season and you go 0-3, 0-4, and you start to think, we're never going to win a game. And getting that first one under your belt always is satisfying because you just want to get that first one under your belt. You want to get that first hit. You want to get that first win. If you're a pitcher, you want to get that first win. If you're a manager, you want to get that first win. If you're a hitter, you want to get that first hit. You want to get that first homer. You don't want droughts leading up to that first. And anything past 0-3 is uncomfortable. Now, they get one more shot at the Brewers on Easter Sunday. We'll see what happens. Uh, But they really do need to get a W just to get everybody off their back. But for Yankee fans, it's a, it's become a very, very pleasurable first couple of days with these wins, 
especially with Soto doing what he's doing, but more than anything else, just doing it in Houston. If it had been somewhere else, it would have been nice, but this makes it extremely pleasurable. And there's nothing wrong with a little cushion. You know, there's nothing wrong with running off five or six to start the season and get a nice little cushion tucked away. Now, sometimes it doesn't mean very much one way or the other. Remember the Yankees in 98, when they broke records, George was having a fit in Seattle after a couple of games because they were off to a lousy start. I mean, and that team, you know, played as well as you would ever see any team play. Winning 125 games, counting the postseason. So, it doesn't mean a whole lot, but it's a whole lot nicer to open 3-0 than it is to open 0-3. And one team is seeing that, and the other team is seeing the other. So you can see it from both sides. Plus, one's on the road beating an arch nemesis, and the other one's home. And had always gotten off fast. Had always gotten that first win historically. So they need a W. Enjoy your Easter Sunday. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.